All right, welcome to episode 38 of the Undiscovered Games video podcast, where we take a look at the lesser-known board games of the world and share those with you. Now, this game today might not be considered undiscovered, but it's definitely what I would call a forgotten game, and this is called Firenze, designed by the great Andreas Stedding way back in 2010. It has beautiful artwork by one of my favorite artists, Michael Menzel. Everything in this game visually looks awesome, from the box to the card artwork to the board itself. This game board is one of those boards you could frame and hang on your wall. It's just a very beautiful game when you see it out on the table. Firenze is a very straightforward Euro game about building towers and then cashing them in for points. It uses an interesting resource management system where you have these cool wooden pieces that stack on top of each other. They're called bricks, and the bricks are your resources. They are used for everything in the game. Not only do you need bricks to build your towers, but you also need bricks to draft specific cards to mitigate certain disasters and to pay your construction costs for building your towers. So it's kind of like multi-use bricks, which is pretty cool. The game also uses a fun card drafting system where you must take a card and then you get all the bricks on it. However, some of the cards are bad cards. So you're always weighing which card you want to draft versus which brick colors you need to collect. The game also has a very nice push your luck aspect to it where there's this constant game of chicken going on between you and the other players as you build up your towers. You're always trying to decide if you should cash in your towers now for the sure points or keep building them a little bit higher to potentially get big points later. The problem is as long as you keep your towers under construction and don't cash them in for the points, you're risking your towers being torn down if you can't keep adding on to them each turn. You're risking an opponent finishing their tower before you and stealing your spot on the board or you risk a card being play that affects your tower, causes it to be torn down or something. So there's some disaster mitigation, some risk management. It can be a very punishing game at times, but there are also some very satisfying and fruitful moments as well, where you can get some big points in a single turn. So it's got a nice balance of all this different stuff going on. This is a very simple game, but it packs quite a punch, especially because the rulebook only has about four pages of actual rules and examples. So it's a very short rulebook. It's very well written and very easy to understand. So I'm not going to do a full tutorial today, but I will show you an overview of how to play the game, and I'll continue to talk about why Firenze is a game I think you should check out. Before we get started, make sure you do click subscribe right here on YouTube at undiscovered underscore games to learn more about lesser known and forgotten board games just like this. All right, let's get started. We're set up now for four players. Each player gets some seals in their player color. This is based on player count, so if you're playing with fewer players, you'll actually get more seals to start the game. Each player also gets their own personal construction site. This is where you will be building your towers before you cash them in for points. Everybody starts with zero victory points up here on the track. And finally, everybody gets a certain number of white bricks, depending on where you are in turn order. The board shows six towers in the six different colors. The colors correspond to the brick colors. Below the towers show a reminder of how many of each color are in the game. So as you can see, there's only eight purple bricks in the whole game where there are 25 white bricks in the game. So the white towers are going to be a lot easier to build than the purple towers. And the point spread out here reflects that. I'll go over that next. So let me show you how the points work. If I build a tower with green bricks, I get points corresponding to the green tower out here on the board. On each tower, you'll see a small number here on the left and then a bigger number here on the right with the black background. The small number is the tower height and the bigger number is the victory points that is worth when you cash it in. For example, if I build a red tower that's five bricks high and I cash that in for points, it's going to be worth four victory points shown here. So when you cash in a tower, you'll place one of your seals out on the board and you claim that space. It blocks it off. You get the points, but nobody else can claim a level five red tower for the rest of the game. I'll talk more about this later, but it creates a very agonizing tension throughout the game, knowing that one of your opponents could always jump in and claim this space. And that's where that game of chicken comes into play, because you can always look around the table and see which towers everyone's building. So if there's some other players out there building red towers, it's 
It's like, do I cash it in right now and get the short points or do I push my luck a little bit and try to go higher and higher? Because you'll notice the victory points get progressively higher as you get, you know, taller towers built. So it's just a really cool tension. And the other thing is when you cash in a tower, you can only cash it in for the exact number of bricks. So a level five tower has to go on the level five. I can't go like lower. You know, if my opponent claims the level five red, then I have a level five red that I didn't get to cash in yet. Well, I'm not allowed to put my seal on a lower number. I would have to keep adding to my red tower and try to go for one of the higher numbered spaces if there's any available. So there's a really cool tension between all the players to compete for these very limited spaces on the board. And I love how you can look around and watch what everybody's doing and sort of gauge, you know, when is the right moment to cash your tower in and when do you want to keep, you know, building it a little higher and get those big points near the top. Now, at the start of the setup, we randomly blocked off five of these areas with these gray seals. This just tightens up the board and makes these levels impossible to claim. So, for example, no one will be claiming the level four yellow tower this entire game. The rule book has some suggestions on how to set this up. I use like a dice rolling method where I roll to determine which tower I'm going to block off and then I roll again to determine the height of that gray seal. So there's some different ways you can do that. And that just offers a nice variable setup so you don't have the same game every time. Another variable part of setup is um, what's called balconies and that's these covering tiles here. You'll notice there are four of them on the board with these Roman numerals and these come out differently each game. You just look at the setup rules that tells you how to do this. But the balconies are going to offer more points than usual when you cash in a tower of this specific height. But they must be completed in the specific order of the Roman numerals. For example, no player could claim this number two balcony here until the number one balcony was claimed. So they sort of progressively unlock, but again, only one player could claim this specific balcony. It's just once this is claimed, then all of a sudden anybody could go for this number two balcony. And then once this one gets claimed, then anybody could go for the number three balcony and so on. Finally, we see these flags at the tops of the towers. The flags are end game points for the player with the most seals in this tower. Remember, you put your seals out every time you cash in a tower for points. So at the end of the game, for example, in this green tower, if the red player had three seals, but the blue player only had two seals, well, the red player has the majority of seals, so they get this three point bonus on the flag. And if multiple players have the same number of seals in a tower, you favor the player who's highest up on the tower. So that's another reason you might want to consider building your towers higher and claiming these top spaces, even though it's quite risky and challenging to get there. You'll also see these four bonus tiles over here. This is just a little race to cash in certain tower heights. So for example, the first player to cash in a level seven tower will get three extra points. They take that tile and then nobody else can get that little bonus. Up here, you'll notice this five point tile. This is awarded to the player who first runs out of seals. So whoever places their final seal on the board takes this tile worth five points and that will trigger the end of the game. Each other player gets one last turn and then you do final scoring. So as you can see, the game is filled with these little races to claim certain colors and claim certain heights before your opponents. You know, you got the balconies, you got these little bonus tiles over here. You might want to be the first player to use up all your seals and get this bonus tile up here. There's also some church cards that come out, which I'll talk about later, and those will give you, you know, some incentive to cash in certain heights for some instant bonus points. So all these little subtle decisions to consider, which all revolve around the very simple idea of building up these towers of different colors. You also have that majority scoring at the end to consider, so you have a great balance here of in-game scoring versus end-game scoring. It's just a great game design, and I haven't even talked about the cards yet, which is one of my favorite parts. Down here, we have our pool of cards to draft, and we have some starting cards that like always start on the top of this deck, but basically you shuffle this deck, and then you draw cards to fill these spots. Then you're going to draw four random bricks from the bag and place them on each card. So players take turns and clock wise order. You follow the sequence, which is shown here on this handy reference card. Once you learn the rules to the game, this reference card is all you're going to need to remember the rules. So I love that they included these, by the way. Your turn is very simple. First, you must take a card from the row of cards here. The first card here on the left is always free to take. But if you don't want this card, you can place a brick on each card leading up to the card that you want to take. So if I want to take this card, I must place a brick here and here, and then I could take this card and all the bricks on this card. The bricks stay on the cards when you pay them, so they'll accumulate, and then eventually somebody's probably going to want to take that card, even if it's a bad card. 
When you take the card, like I said, you get to keep all the bricks on them, which you can use right away, you know, in the later steps of your turn. There are some cards that modify this. For example, when you play the princess card, she lets you take any card here without paying those bricks to the cards before it. So the cards can really drive your decisions, but so do the colors of the bricks that are on the cards. You have what's called your storehouse, which is basically any bricks that are not on your construction site. So you just keep those off to the side. Then once you start building your towers, they go here on your construction site. So when you collect the bricks from the cards, you keep them here in your storehouse. Let's briefly talk about some of the cards. There are good cards and bad cards in this deck, and that's one of my favorite aspects of the game because you're always forced to take that card at the beginning of your turn. So there are some great decisions to weigh. You know, when you see a card filled with brick colors that you really want, but the card does something bad to you, that's a really fun decision to weigh. The deck has a few types of cards shown by the symbol at the top, and they're very simple to understand. They're summarized here on this other reference card here. Basically, like the flag cards are going to give you some sort of end game scoring that can be good or bad. The building cards will stay out in front of you for the rest of the game, and those just offer you a recurring ability, such as you know cheaper construction costs or a higher hand limit, things like that. The lightning bolt cards happen the moment that you draft them. For example, the storehouse fire makes you put three bricks from your storehouse back into the bag. That's punishing, but probably the most punishing card in the whole deck is the tribute card, because this affects every player at the table, including you, when you take the card. And what this says is every tower that you have currently on your construction site, you have to pay a brick from your storehouse back to the bag, and it has to match the color of the tower. If you can't do this, you're going to lose those towers. So like if I had a red and a green tower already under construction, and somebody takes this tribute card, I have to be able to pay a red and a green brick over here from my storehouse back to the bag. And if I can't do that, these towers get torn down. And this is one of those cards where if you've never played the game, this could take you by surprise. And, you know, it kind of takes a learning game to learn what all these cards do. They're very simple once you learn them. But if you're teaching a new player, you really have to warn them about some of these cards, specifically the tribute card, because I almost always keep some extra bricks in my storehouse of the colors I'm building, just in case that tribute card comes out, just to kind of mitigate, you know, against that, manage that risk a little bit. So it's really cool cards here. Some of the other ones, like these church cards, have this cross symbol. This is sort of like a community card that gets placed out on the board as soon as somebody drafts it. And these church cards just do various things for the whole table. For example, the major privilege says the next player to cash in a level 7 tower gets 4 extra points. And then this card gets discarded. So these just throw some extra little variety into the game, some little side quests, things like that. Finally, we have the people cards. These are just going to offer you a one-time ability when you play the card and then you discard it from the game. You can use them right away when you draft them, or you can keep them and store them for a later turn. These are just going to do things like lower your construction costs or break other little rules, maybe swap out some bricks, or there's one here, the Patrician, which I really like, because you can either use it to ignore a bad lightning card that you draft, or you can use it to discard a card from your hand that you don't want, like one of the negative scoring cards or something. So every one of these cards in the deck is awesome. I really like how they they interact with each other and there's not that many cards to learn and once you learn the cards the game just gets better and better and better so definitely give it a learning game to get familiar with all these cards and once you have a grasp on what might be coming out and how to react against them it's so much fun okay so back to your turn after you draft that mandatory card you're going to slide all these cards down and draw a new card off the top and then you refill it with four bricks from the back now this is the only part of the game that is not smooth you know it's kind kind of fiddly to keep moving these cards and drawing bricks every turn. But other than this, the game is silky smooth, so that doesn't bother me too much. After you do that, now you have the chance to make a 3 to 1 trade if you wish. You can take any 3 bricks in your storehouse over here and trade them for any one brick that's on a card out here. You just swap them, put 3 out and take one off. You can only do that exchange once per turn and that's totally optional. And then the next part of your turn is also optional, but this is kind of the 
meat of the game, which is building towers. When you build towers, each tower can only contain one color of bricks. So if I start building a red tower here, then this tower is only going to have red bricks, whereas this tower over here can only have yellow bricks. Pretty simple. Uh, the cost for adding new bricks to your construction site is summarized right here very nicely. So what this says is every time I add this many bricks, I have to pay this many bricks back to the bag. So let's say I had two red bricks, one blue brick, and one green brick that I want to add to my construction site this turn. So I add them here like this. I added four new bricks. That means I have to pay three more bricks back to the bag. And those can be of any color, the ones that you pay with. But if I didn't have three leftover bricks over here, I couldn't even do that. So you have to keep some extra bricks as currency to pay your construction costs. And as you can see, it gets very expensive the more bricks you want to add. If I want to add six bricks, I'm going to have to pay 10 extra bricks, which is very hard to even get that many bricks saved up during the game. Now, the next step of your turn is one of my favorite parts because it's called tear down abandoned construction and this is where if you didn't add at least one brick to any tower that you had started you're going to lose that tower every tower that you had started at the beginning of your turn if you didn't build at least one more brick onto it you're going to lose it it gets torn down and i love this rule it makes the game so much more challenging in a good way you know it's really crunchy you really have to plan so when you build towers you have to make sure you save some colors back that match your towers so that you can keep adding to them next round so any towers that you didn't add to get torn down completely you get to keep half the bricks in your storehouse but the other half go back in the bag and odd numbers are not rounded in your favor so you're going to lose a ton of progress if you don't keep adding to your towers every turn so i just really like that rule it takes a very simple idea and it just elevates it to the next level of difficulty without adding too many new rules it's just you better add to every tower that you started every round and you better save back some brick colors of the towers you have started like if I have a red and a green tower started, I better save back some red and green bricks in my storehouse, especially because if a player plays one of those cards that makes you lose some bricks, then when it gets back to you, you might not have the red and green brick anymore. And it's like, oh no, I didn't plan enough. And that's where it really benefits to know all the cards and be familiar with what might happen. So you can sort of mitigate that risk. You know, it's risk management. There's a lot of risk management in this game. Sometimes things are going to happen. They're out of your control, but everybody's in the same boat and it's just a really punishing game in a fun way. You know, it really feels like a grind to get a tower completed. And I like that. I like that. It's not a build, 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 just cash in for all these points. You know, when you cash in a tower, it's really rewarding because you felt like you had to work to get there. And that's the next step of your turn is actually cashing in your towers. So after you tear down any abandoned towers, you can cash in as many towers as you want. Want, as long as there are spaces available on the board. So for example, if I had three towers, you know, I have a level three blue, a level four red, and a level seven yellow, I look out, I see the level four red is already taken by another player. So since my tower is four bricks high, I cannot cash this tower in. I can't take anything lower than four, so I'm going to be forced to keep building this red tower higher. Now let's look at my level three blue. This space is available, so I could cash that in and claim that space. So if I want to do that, I just put my seal here, I score the two points right away, and then my blue tower is finished and all these go back in the bag. So maybe I don't want to cash in my blue tower yet, maybe I want to keep it under construction and go for the bigger points up here. The risk is if I don't add at least one more blue brick next turn, then it's going to get torn down before I get to score it. The other risk is, you know, if my opponents are also building blue towers, they might claim these spaces before I can cash in my blue tower. Now let's look at my level seven yellow. Now the level seven space is available. However, you'll notice it's a balcony and it's the number four balcony. Now, since the number three balcony has not been claimed yet, I cannot claim this space and I'm going to be forced to keep building my yellow tower up to level eight next turn. So you really have to keep an eye on a lot of things for a very simple idea here. Now, let's just say for the sake of this example, let's say the number three balcony was claimed by, let's say, the blue player. So that unlocked the number four balcony. That means it's available to take. So I want to cash in my level seven tower here. I put these back in the bag. I put my seal 
chill out on this balcony and I score 13 points. These balconies are awesome, by the way. And then I check to see if the bonus tile is taken and it's not. So I'm the first player to cash in a level seven tower, which means I get another three points and I take this tile off the board. So there's some great rewarding moments as well as punishing moments. You know, if you can pull off a big turn like that, you get a ton of points. It's a game changer. So after you cash in all your towers, then the last step of your turn is check your hand limit. You can only carry over 10 bricks in your storehouse. Now that does not count your towers that you have under construction. So any uh, bricks that are off your board, you're limited to 10. So you just have to discard down to 10. And then your hand limit of cards is five. So there's an interesting twist with the cards because the flag cards, which are the scoring cards, can never be discarded when you're checking your hand limit. So if you get a lot of scoring cards built up, you're going to be limited in the other cards that you can carry over into the next round. That's another great little subtle, simple rule that really makes for some interesting depth of decisions. There's also a warehouse card you can get that increases your hand limit here. So lots of great cards and variability in this deck. So the game just continues like this. Players take turns going clockwise around the table. As soon as somebody places that final seal on the board, they take that top tile worth five points and that triggers the end of the game. Each other player takes one more turn and then you do your final scoring, which is tallying up all your flag cards, both positive and negative cards there, and then tallying up that majority scoring for each tower like we talked about. Remember, whoever has the most seals gets the points showing on the flag at the top and ties are broken in favor of whoever is higher on the tower. So that's an overview of how to play Firenze. I didn't cover every single rule, but that's the crux of the game. You know, draft a card, build towers. Uh, you must add to any towers that you've already started and then cash in your towers for points. Very simple, smooth, quick turns, even though the video, you know, took me a long time to explain it and show it to you. It's a very fast moving game. Again, other than having to refill this card row every single turn, other than that, the game is very smooth. It just zips around the table. We like to have uh, the player who just finished their turn, they're kind of like the board maintenance person for the next turn. So the bag sort of trails behind the active player. So as soon as you're done with your turn, you're going to be, you know, refilling the card row and the bricks during the next player's turn. And if you do it this way, it doesn't, you know, create too much fiddliness because everybody kind of takes turns maintaining the board. On the surface, Firenze seems overly simple when you first learn it. However, the game, like I said, can be very punishing if you push your luck too far by building too high or if you don't plan out your moves properly where you can keep adding to your towers. It's one of those Euro games I'm just always in the mood to play. There's so much variety each game and I don't have to relearn the rules every time I sit down to play it. I also love the variability. You know, the game feels very different every time you play. Part of that is because it's a variable setup you know you put out those blocking seals differently every time you put out different you know setup of balconies every time the cards are going to come out in different order the brick colors are totally randomized but then you also get a ton of variability from the players decisions during the game you're always pacing against your opponents reacting to their decisions while also trying to formulate your long-term plan so it's tactical and strategic and if i had to sum up what i like most about Firenze, it's the balance that it strikes with everything that it does. You know, you have your in-game scoring and your end-game scoring. Great balance there. You have a great balance of tactics versus strategy. You know, reacting to short-term things versus planning long-term. There's a nice balance of game-based decisions versus player-based decisions. You know, reacting to the cards and the brick colors versus reacting to your opponents. What are they doing? What color towers are they building? Where are they wanting to go? Which bonuses are they going for? And things like that. You can kind of look around and guess what certain opponents are going Going for, And then you have to weigh, do you want to compete directly with them? Do you want to go out and build your own color towers and things like that? So many good decisions in this game, all wrapped up into a very simple to understand format. There's also a balance of good cards versus bad cards. I love weighing, you know, which bricks do I really want and which cards do I really want? Sometimes it's best to just take a bad card if you can get a ton of good bricks out of it. It's pretty neat how the cards, you know, fill up with more and more bricks as players pay to skip them. You know, we see this mechanism a lot in games, but I just like it because it eventually somebody's going to take a bad card. It kind of reminds me of the game No Thanks, you know, where everybody pays to not take the card. Eventually somebody takes the card and gets all the chips on it. So I've always liked that mechanism, and this game uses it really well. Um, finally, talking about the balance and everything, I think the game strikes 
the perfect balance of complexity. It sits right in the middle of the Board Game Geek weight complexity of around two and a half out of five. And I agree with that. You know, it's super simple to learn, but don't be fooled. I mean, this game offers some very deep decisions. And even though it's like a gateway game, you know, as far as the rules are concerned, I would consider this more of a gamer's game because the, the game really comes alive when you get a group of gamers at the table who have played the game before and are familiar with the cards that might be coming out. The game just gets better and better. You know, the more you learn these cards, that's where the game gets really good. So give it a couple plays, and I think you'll see why I like this game so much. Firenze is a 9 out of 10 for me. That's an easy 9 out of 10. Now, the only thing that keeps this from being a little higher than that is the fiddly card row and restocking those bricks every time. And that's a very minor gripe, but it does get annoying as you play the game. So, you know, that's probably the only thing that drags the rating down significantly. There are some brutal moments that are out of your control that you try to plan for and you just can't. And sometimes those can be very devastating and very deflating feeling at times. But the game is simple and is pretty quick to play, so it shouldn't bother you too much. I just really love games like this where the complexity comes from reacting to your opponents and a changing board and not from trying to remember the rules. I think you'll like the cutthroat competition too for those spaces on the board. The game, I mean, it can be mean at times, but really you just feel like you're competing against each other for this very limited space that just gets more and more and more limiting as more players put their seals out and block off those certain spaces. So I really like that tension and that just builds and builds and gets more tense toward the end of the game. I just love weighing, you know, how high do I want to build this tower? Should I even go for this blue tower because there's only one blue space left? So lots of great things like that to consider throughout the game. And even if you don't like the cutthroat nature or the punishing nature of this game, one thing I think you will love is the resource management because that multi-use bricks idea is really cool. Andreas Stedding is a master of the multi-use mechanism, you know, where your resources can be used for multiple functions. Um, I covered one of his lesser known games called Cog. I featured that on a different video, which you can check out, but he uses these multi-use tiles with numbers. You can use those tiles to bid for turn order or to move your ships around or to do all these different things throughout the game. That's like the whole game is managing these multi-use tiles. And he does this a lot. I mean, my favorite game of all time is Hansa Teutonica. He uses just simple cubes and you use your cubes to build routes or build offices or, you know, spend them to knock other players off of spots. So Firenze has those steading fingerprints all over it. And if you like any of his other games, definitely check this one out. One more thing I want to comment on is the player count. Now, I would say Firenze plays well at all player counts, but for different reasons. It definitely has a different feel at each player count. Obviously, the board is going to be much tighter at four players than it is at two players, but you do get more seals to use in the lower player counts. So this game does scale very nicely in that regard. Now, a two-player game allows you to do a little more long-term planning because the cards are not getting cycled through as much. So at four players, you know, you got to figure three cards are going to be taken before it gets back to you. Whereas at a two-player game, only one of those cards is going to be gone before it's your turn again. So this drastically changes your approach to the game, but not in a bad way. It just makes it a different feel. Now, personally, I like the game best at four players. It's just a very challenging balance of how high to build your towers, when to cash them in, when to go for those majority scorings. You know, you're competing for those limited spaces on the board with four players. That's very limiting, but it is very punishing at four players and you're going to get knocked down a lot. So if you don't like that, maybe try it at three players first. You know, it just kind of depends on the type of game you like. Um, I'll let you discover what your favorite player count is. And if you've ever played this game, let me know in the comments what player count is your favorite. And also, what is your favorite Andreas Stedding game? He's one of my favorite designers, and I would love to know what your favorite Stedding game is. What's your favorite tower building game? You know, I featured Asara on an earlier episode. I'd have to say Asara is probably my favorite tower building game, but I really like Firenze a lot. And another one I really like is called Patrician, where you build towers with these same types of wooden bricks that stack. And Patrician is a much different game, though, than Firenze, so I wouldn't compare them other than they use these same bricks. So thanks for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. If you want to support the channel, there's a digital tip jar in the description below. It's just a PayPal link. You can donate any amount you like, but I do not expect that whatsoever. It's just one of many ways for you to show your support for this channel. If you like what I do, 
I'm really passionate about bringing all these lesser known games to the forefront and I want to continue to do that. So another way you can really help the channel is to make sure you click subscribe right here on YouTube. Make sure all your board gaming friends are subscribed as well. It's at undiscovered underscore games right here on YouTube and over on Instagram. Same handle undiscovered underscore games and over on Instagram I post a lot of cool photos and written reviews, some other games that didn't make it to my YouTube channel and things like that. So if you're on IG, say hi to me over there. I got some more great episodes on the way. I'm working on another two-player games episode. I'm working on my top 50 games of all time. That's going to be an epic video. I can't wait for that one. And of course, my regular dosage of undiscovered games like this one today. So make sure you stay tuned for all that stuff coming soon. Until the next video, I am your undiscovered host saying thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.